Okay. Hey, this is Stefan Kinsella with a rare original episode. Uh, this will probably be Kinsella on Liberty 369. And today I'm talking with my friend Greg Moran, and we're going to talk, we're going to do basically a postmortem of my Soho Forum debate on intellectual property with Richard Epstein back in November. Um, Greg and I, uh, Re Greg went with me and we talked about it a lot after, and we should have recorded this right then when it was fresh, but we'll see what we can do. Um, Greg, why don't you say hello and introduce yourself? Uh, well, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Greg Morin. I've uh, uh, been involved in liberty movement stuff for past 10 years or so. Um, I own a small business, um, so that's kind of my area of expertise, I guess, some real world implementation, some of our ideas and how government has impacted it. And uh, I try to be a benefactor where I can to uh, help any of these uh, areas of our movement to push the ball forward as much as we can. Okay. And so my podcast feed, as most of people that listen uh, know, <clears throat> is usually just uh, copies of appearances on other programs or uh, speeches or appearances. I just started this years ago because it was a convenient way to uh, just assemble them. And on occasion, about every 30, 50 episodes, maybe I'll do an interview or something or an independent episode. Um, so Greg and I, um, actually, we traveled. Last year was a heavy traveling year for both of us, I think, right? Um, yeah. We went, where, where did we go together? We went to Alaska, biking yeah, with I Juan Carpio. Uh, Freedom Fest was first in South Dakota. Freedom yeah. Fest in South Dakota. Then Alaska. And then, um, and then Turkey. Turkey, Hoppa's Property and Freedom Society. Yeah. And then, and then, Florida, uh, Florida, and then we did, Florida. we did November. Uh, what, was St. Petersburg first? Yeah, St. Saint Saint Petersburg was in October. Yeah, that was the Mises uh, Supporter yeah. Summit in St. Petersburg. And then we did uh, Turkey in September. Hoppa's yeah. PFS, Property Freedom Society meeting. So York, lots of fun. November. <laughs> And then, oh, then November, New York. And yeah. then Houston in December. So almost that's right. And Ron Paul's thing in Houston. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was a busy year. I'm going to take off most of next year until yeah. uh, until maybe uh, Turkey in September. Um, just stay home and try to get some things written. Um, and you're a hardcore Rothbardian, Austrian, and big Mises yeah. Institute supporter yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and, and you kind of played a, uh, the, the final. Uh, key in that 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 transition where you know i had been exposed to rothbard first and and read his foreign new liberty and that really opened um quite a bit um in terms of, of my interpretation of things that i've been taught you know every chapter i went into that it was one of oh well he's crazy this there's no way he can justify this and then by the end of the, the chapter you're like yeah okay i can see that that makes sense um but i think ip that's sort of the the final linchpin in the whole thing and once you accept and understand why it's not legitimate then everything else comes into focus because that's that's sort of the last vestige that's the last uh, uh the point where most people kind of get a hang up and, and kind of feel like well we still need the state to, to manage this and, and and once you under basically understand what property is right and everything else falls into place right yeah it's interesting because um as i've said many times i mean i had so many talks on my podcast feed and elsewhere on ip i i mean i they blur together i know lots of people yeah. listen to all of them or some of them and sometimes people say what's the best one and usually it's one of the most recent ones because i keep finding new ways to capit uh, recapitulate the argument yeah i mean basically i wrote this thing in 19 i don't remember 98 or 99 or 2000 for the jls it was a long article which they later published as a monograph in 2008 but it was just one of a series of libertarian legal theory things I was writing, and I wrote it partly because I there was a huge gap in uh, or, or bad treatments of it in the literature. And I was a patent lawyer and a libertarian, so I thought I'll tackle this. And you know, I've sort of been typecast in a way because probably two thirds of my invitations on programs and and, and uh, conferences is on IP, which I don't really even mind it because it, it has been a gold mine of forcing me to figure out number one ways of arguing for it and also sorting out property and contract and all these things. Um, and so it's kind of deepened my understanding of libertarian legal theory in general, which is still my main interest. But um, 
And so my original article is a little monograph, and I, I stand by pretty much everything in it, uh, although I'd probably be a little bit harsher on trademark than I was then. Um, I kind of gave it an out clause saying that to the extent it covers fraud, but you know, to the extent it covers fraud, we already have fraud law, so uh, it's really something beyond fraud law. And I probably would emphasize or define what I meant by scarcity more as the concept of economic uh, rivalrousness because – when you say scarcity, a lot of people will equivocate and they'll say, oh, well, good ideas are scarce. So they're using the word scarcity in a different sense. But if you, if you call it rivalry or rivalrousness, then they can't say that. They can't say ideas are rivalrous because it's a classic example of something that is not rivalrous. <laughs> um, well, so go so ahead. I, and a quick question on that because I've tried to kind of clarify things for myself. and I kind of take notes on my own and, and try to gel these ideas. And, and one of the thoughts I had is that it, is there a distinction between scarcity and rivalrousness? So in, in one sense, air is not scarce, but it's technically on the atomic level, it's rivalrous. So you, you would have to have at least both of those things to be the case. Um, Correct. Well, so I think it, that gets into a whole area um, of, of the proper understanding, like the realms of economics and human action mm -hmm. combined with the physical or causal realms. So <clears throat> When you think in terms of Mises, he, he, he focused on scarce means of action, and by means, he meant the things that you can employ um, to interfere with the causal and material things happening in the world around us to achieve your ends, and he distinguished that from uh, background conditions, or he has some – and Rothbard used a similar terminology, so – Background conditions are like facts about the universe, you know, like the fact that we have three-dimensional space to move around in, and and I think he sort of lumps that in in with that things that are technically physically scarce in the sense you just mentioned, but that are so um, that are so plentiful that we don't bother to economize them. Right. So if you don't in your action regard it or you or, or have to treat it as something to be economized. Then he treats it as a background condition of action, um, and I do think there maybe can be a little work done to clarify some of that because he also has some comments like, in a division of labor, we employ other people as means. But what he means there is so he used the word means in, in different senses. So sometimes he uses it in the, to mean scarcity, scarce means. Sometimes he means he uses it to mean things that we just use to get our ends achieved. So if I hire someone to bake a cake for me. The way I got the cake was to employ someone, but they're not technically a scarce means of action in the sense of an object that you can own, right? right. So there's a little bit of um, fuzziness in some of these definitions. I think the way Hoppe gets at it, because see, unlike Rothbard in my so Mises focused on scarcity to a degree. Um, Although one thing he neglected, and which I think everyone neglects, is like in the praxeological framework. To simplify it, we humans envision a future coming. We're not happy with what we think is coming, and we look around to see what we can do to change it and to achieve a better future. So that's what action is. So it means that action has two fundamental things that are essential for successful action. One is the availability of these, these sort of levers or these tools, these things we can grapple with and grasp and command and control to change the course of events, to causally interfere with things. So that's what Mises would call scarce means, or I might call a scarce resource or a tool uh, or a material you know, object. Um, but you also have to have knowledge that guides your actions, your decisions. And property rights emerge for the first because those resources are the things you can have conflict over. So I've actually developed a concept called conflictability, which I think gets at the essence of the things that can be owned. Anything that you use to achieve your ends as a means that is conflictable, that you can have conflict with other people over, that's what you need property rights for. So I think that this idea of conflictability is roughly the same as rivalrousness and scarcity in the economic sense. So Hoppe emphasized that scarcity in the economic sense is distinguished from uh, – scarcity is the opposite of superabundance. Most people think of scarcity as the opposite of abundance. So they think like some things are in relative terms. Like if everyone likes bananas and there's like a few bananas around, they're, they're very scarce. But if there's a lot of bananas where they're cheap, they're abundant. But in the economic sense of scarcity, which is the opposite of superabundance… 
even if you have billions of bananas on the world, they're they're technically um, scarce because each banana is a is a is a conflictable resource that you could have a conflict over. I do think that at, it's sort of like in math, like um, you know when we do these limits, like in calculus, and 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 um, we, you could think of abundance at the limit becomes superabundance. So if something becomes so plentiful in a practical sense that you don't have to economize like air, then you can treat it like it's super abundant. So that's why it's not considered a scarce means. Anyway, that gets into the weeds a little bit, but that's sort of how I think about it. Yeah. But Maybe the bottom line is that action is a practical thing and property rights are a practical thing designed to come up with norms or rules that specify who owns the things that we can have a conflict over, which are conflictable or scarce resources. That makes sense? Yeah. I was just going to throw in one comment or thought that superabundance perhaps could be interpreted like I was talking about with air, where it's something that it requires no um, work or effort on anyone's part. So even, even bananas may be super abundant. They may be very, very abundant. They grow everywhere, but it still requires that somebody go and cultivate them and retrieve Correct. them. There's still yeah. work involved in that, whereas something like air is just, it's simply everywhere. Correct. But, but that, that could also be time and place dependent. So if you're on a space colony or on the moon, there probably really Correct. would be property rights in air because it is not any right. more super abundant. Yeah, and lots of sci-fi novels, uh, yeah. air is something people own. I mean, right, right. when that right. Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and uh, the right. moon is a harsh mistress. And right. um, now the way I think about it is that um, um, technically speaking, so Hoppe comes up and other people come up with these thought experiments like the Garden of Eden or the land of Cocagne or cocaine or however you pronounce it, um, this, this land of superabundance. It's not really a realistic example, sort of like Rothbard's evenly rotating economy is not a realistic example. It's, it's almost unimaginable, but they do these unrealistic thought experiments or Gedanken experiments um, to illustrate, to isolate one phenomenon to, to analyze it, right? Yeah. So I do think there's some analytical problems with thinking seriously about superabundance. I think technically speaking, in a strict sense, the concept of superabundance only applies to information or knowledge because that is something that can be infinitely copied and used by an infinite number of people at the same time without conflict. And that is that, com that, that second ingredient of human action, which I was going to say I think has received short attention in the Austrian literature. They focus on means and, and economizing using these means, but very relatively little attention is given to knowledge, and when it is given attention, it's done in a, in a sort of misleading way, like by the Hayekians talking about knowledge being dispersed. But that's not the key thing. I think the key way to look at it is from a praxeological lens. And what I was also going to say is that, like the key thinkers in my mind would be Roth, uh, Mises, Rothbard, then Hoppe. Mises did focus on scarcity, but only to a certain extent. But he didn't focus on knowledge. I mean, he recognized it on occasion, but it's like side side comments. Mm -hmm. Rothbard seemed to me not to focus on scarcity so much, but on other other economic analyses. Hoppe revived it because he's more of a Misesian than Rothbard was, more of a Kantian. So Hoppe refocused on scarcity, and because of his keen uh, uh, focus on scarcity. He used that in his property theory, which made him more of a radical libertarian than, than Mises, but it also allowed him instantly to see the problem with intellectual property. Like he, He's so such a deep, praxeological thinker, building upon Rothbard and Mises, like getting the radical politics from Rothbard and the, and the praxeology from Mises. He instantly saw the problem like back in 88 with, with IP. He just said, look, a, a formula or knowledge is infinitely usable. You can't own that. He instantly saw that because he had such a clear understanding of praxeology. Um, so that's how I look at it, and uh, I think my, my my contribution is just kind of assembling those three strands of thought. <laughs> and I, I think the, the the rivalrous component that's the most critical part, particularly to the the discussion on IP. So I was reviewing the debate again before we had this our conversation here, and one of the things that struck me is that I know going into it, you were instructed that. The, the debate was to focus on a, a more utilitarian standpoint rather than a theoretical one. Yeah. The problem, the problem with that approach is you, you really were forced to debate with one arm time behind your back, essentially. Correct. Because what, what, what Epstein essentially does is, and he, it's, a, it's a very good analogy, which you know, appeals to a lot of people is to say, well, it, with, with real tangible goods, we have exclusive rights in these things so that we can incentivize people to economize properly and, and give them an incentive to 
develop these goods because if everything were held in common, then th this incentive wouldn't exist. So clearly, if this, we all understand that this makes sense with real goods, so obviously it would work with ideas and uh, intellectual property as well. So given that, it's like, well, yeah, I guess, okay, well, if you give someone a certain right for a certain period of time, it will incentivize them. But that's, it's sort of begging the question because it just says, okay, well, we just make the assumption right. it's a legitimate right when in fact it's not because of the rivalrous component of it. Right. Yeah, that's the whole reason that we define property in the way we do. The reason that you give someone an exclusive right in their farm versus the other person is because they can't both farm it at the same time. Right. Whereas the idea that it doesn't exist. So that, that was kind of something I picked up on that it kind of actually made your job a lot more difficult. Although yeah. I suppose going into a whole, you know, it, there's only a limited amount of time. So there's only so much you can go. Correct. Into, you know, well, and let, let, let me set up the background. So while we're doing this, this talk today. Um, um, so as I mentioned earlier, so my podcast feed is just when I get invited on someone's show or to speak, I just record it and I put it on here. And I've never been, you know, like I've never, I've never hardly ever in my life asked someone to be on their show. I'm not a self promoter. I don't care. I only go where I'm asked to go. Um, but I did think that Soho Forum, which I'm a fan of and admire of for years, um, I, I, you know, I, I ran into Gene Epstein, I think one time at, at, um, at Stringham's place in New York about four or five years ago. And I said, you know, you should do IP sometime. And uh, then I ran into him at Porkfest this year and we talked for a long time and I said, you should do IP. I said, I don't care if it's me. I mean, I'm probably the best at it, but there I can, here's four or five other people who could do it. And Gene kept wanting it to be, he said, well, to get it done right, we're, we're going to need to focus on empirics and examples in the pharmaceutical case. So we finally got Richard Epstein to agree to do it. And he's an, of course, a Chicago type uh, utilitarian libertarian. Um, and so he's pro IP. Classical liberal. He's <laughs> yeah, he's pro IP. And his argument is basically the, the standard, you know, the standard Chicago argument. It's not a principled case at all, right? It's not a proprietarian argument. And in my view, I've always been like, even with Ayn Rand, I've always been like rights based, like what's the right thing to do? What's moral? So I, I, my, my argument always from the beginning, from 82, since I've been a libertarian, was, yeah, antitrust law is wrong because even if two businessmen could collude and set prices, they have a right to, right? Or even if uh, you, know, you could offer to pay someone a below subsistence wage, then the minimum wage is still wrong. Uh, it, it was only a secondary argument that, oh, well, as a practical matter, people can't collude, like cartels are not feasible. Um, but given, and, given enough time, these things won't last, and that's, correct. that's usually the argument from people that, 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 that say that we have to have intervention. Well, we can't possibly let this you know, persist for more than five seconds. We have to have someone come in and, 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 and try to override it. Right. If we, we know that if you just allow enough time, these things basically have to sort themselves out, that, that if you're going to have a cartel, then someone is going to undercut them. Someone's going to figure out how to compete against that or if someone's right. you know under underpaid then someone's going to come in and pay them a little bit more and essentially the problem sorts itself out yeah and so you know I, and i think over the over the years the argument um it, to me is once people get it the ip thing they see it it's so clear it's like yeah. one of the it's one of the clearest libertarian arguments it's sort of like the drug war it's like there's no good arguments for it and there's really no good argument for ip once you understand how to approach it uh, and like I was going to say earlier, uh, I agree with everything in my first article. That was over 20 years ago, and I've come up with other arguments and ways of presenting it. So I do plan to write something later, but um, I just wanted the ideas to get out there. And Soho yeah. Forum has a big uh, thing, so I did. That's the, like one of the few times I've, I've uh, kind of like twisted someone's arm to have me on. So Gene agreed to it, and I was happy to comply with his wishes to bend it in a more utilitarian way. Um, I was kind of uh, optimistic that I would win, but the more I thought about it, it's like Epstein is so smart. He knows so much. He's so, he's so authoritative. He knows how to drop a lot of buzzwords and things that are slightly over people's heads, so they assume he knows who he's talking about. Yeah. Plus, the audience was – it was a COVID audience, so it was New York. Everyone had to be vaccinated, so that automatically reduces the number of radical people in the audience. So, yeah, so I lost, but it was a, you know it was close, it, and it, I was, it was – one, It was – I did the math. It was one vote. Like yeah, any, and, and, any other person, it would have gone yeah, way. and I made the mistake of inviting two people <laughs> – or, or alerting two people to it who tuned in who I'm pretty sure voted against me. So I actually got two votes against me. Yeah. 
it was my fault. But I didn't care. I didn't really care. I, I just didn't want to lose badly. I wanted to present the case. I just want I didn't care what the audience thought, to be honest. I wanted the I wanted people why and there's been over ten thousand or fourteen thousand views now. So that's good. So yeah. uh, I just did, wanted to read it. And you did change votes, so those were all wins. I changed votes, so that was good. Yeah. Um yeah. and in the end, I, so I did start out with the pharmaceutical stuff and the empirical stuff because that's what I was asked to do. But in my closing, I did go with this uh, more principled thing about praxeology and the difference between knowledge and scarce means. Um, the problem with the empirical approach is that it's not principled and it's ad hoc, and there are like an endless number of cases that they can demand that you answer. And even if you answer them, they will just come back with another one. It's, it's sort of like if a, a welfare statist – if we say, well, I'm against welfare for moral reasons because it re requires theft, but they don't care about morality. They care about feeding the poor you know, or whatever or housing the poor. Mm -hmm. So if you say – if you give historical examples and use economic reasoning and, and, and other, other reasoning to show that, well, it's very likely that – um, you know, the poor would be able to they do they do better in a capitalist society without welfare because you know they'd be richer and they'd have more opportunity for jobs and there'd be charity for the rest. Even if you show that, then uh, your your welfare opponent will just say, "Well, can you guarantee that?" Yeah. <laughs> it's like, "Well, I can't guarantee it, but you can't guarantee it either because Social Security is about to go bankrupt." <laughs> right, right. And, and and even if even if they accept that it would work, they'll they'll just turn to the next thing. They'll say, "Well, what about?" Um, what about clothing? What about housing? What about education? Like it's a never-ending barrage of demands that you give them guarantees. And this is what the IP guys do. They basically have this idea in their mind that that they're the that the free market and capitalism are roughly good, but there can be market failures because of what they call holdout problems and free rider effects, which reduces the otherwise ideal efficiency of an ideal free market, but so they think there's market failure, and the government can come in and identify these and fix it with interventions, and the interventions seem on their face to be violations of property rights, but these utilitarians believe that, yeah, they do hurt people some degree, but they break these log jams in these market failures, and they overall increase the size of the pie of wealth for everyone, mm -hmm. so and you can use that surplus that you generated by this government intervention to compensate the people that you took from. That's Richard Epstein's whole takings idea. Yeah, so that's eminent, their that's their theory, right? It's an eminent domain argument, basically. Yeah, take a taking eminent domain yeah, or condemnation. We, yeah, we, admit, or, we, yeah. we admit we're taking it from someone, but society benefits on the whole, so it's okay. Yeah. So so but Epstein in his book Takings, he basically uses that theory to say, look, government's justified because on occasion it can it can identify a market failure caused by a holdout problem or a free rider problem and take some property to make a road or whatever, and it could tax people to do that, and they're better off because they have a road that they couldn't have had without government takings or eminent domain, and the person you took from, you can pay him compensation, and everyone's better off. But he says, but by this logic, most federal government programs don't satisfy this test, so they're unconstitutional or they – because they violate the takings clause, and they 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 actually don't make us better off. So, like the you know uh, the FDA, like lots of, lots of administrative agencies, he says they just don't fail the, they don't pass the test. So he condemns them. The problem is in other writings he supports intellectual property because he just makes this abstract argument that well, if there's a market, if the holdout problem, and if the government can accurately identify it, and if the government can grant these limited monopolies on patents and copyrights. Then they can make us all better off because the value of the extra innovation and creativity that we generate by these market interventions is greater than the cost of these programs in the first place, these takings. But he never shows it. So that was the, right. my first my first 15, 17 and a half minutes. I just went through all the – literally all the well-known studies that I'm aware of, all of them. Um, well, there's a few more on my side, but like I'm not – like I didn't bury the ones that are on his side because there are none. So I just went like if you're going from an empirical point of view, all the evidence shows that um, there's – well, it shows that there's no evidence that the patent system, say, for example, generates net innovation, or, or they conclude that it actually slows down innovation for obvious reasons because it prevents you from competing with someone, and you, you can rest upon your monopoly for 17 years. You don't need to innovate as much. Um, it distorts innovation. 
So I so like my view is that the burden of proof would be on the, the Chicago guy Epstein like to show okay, just like you condemned all the administrative agencies because they don't pass the takings test, IP doesn't pass the takings test unless you can show with evidence, with some empirical study. Right. So I'm curious. That, so when he can when he condemns the other programs as not passing the test, what? What method is he using to do that, and and is he applying the same method to IP, or is it simply he's using his, a method? His opinion, or it it seems like because, and 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 I quote in one, as I just rewatched it, he says, uh, so he's basically saying you you offer no evidence to support this position, but I think on balance it probably is not the case. Right. He so just basically thinks. his whole argument is well, my personal the subjective yeah. feel of what because it is. I, but, it's, probably, it's probably not true so we'll yeah. just proceed from well, that assumption and go from there so I'm, I'm, if, if he is able to say well for these government programs we can show that they don't meet this test and why couldn't we apply those same standards to ip yeah and i'm wondering if it's because essentially i don't see actually how you could unless you perform an experiment between two different countries and you make and you make comparisons because they're all contrafactual whether or not this government program you know may, maybe some welfare program actually did on net would have perhaps you know correct benefited a handful of people greater than the amount that was taken or however you, you, know, you could make I, that I can't comparison, I, which i don't think you can but let's say somehow hypothetically you could well it's still a contrafactual so it's kind of the same problem you, you can't I, really know I, yeah for sure. I, it's, I read the whole book but it's been a while. I was in law school, um, and so I can't remember exactly how he goes about attacking these programs. He gives – I think he – I don't think he uses empirical studies that much. Maybe to some degree he does, but I don't think he relies on a burden of proof thing either. I don't think he just says, well, the proponents of the FDA or the National Endowment for the Arts or, 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 the, or, 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 or the FCC or whatever or the, or, or the FTC um, – he, I don't think he says they haven't satisfied their burden of proof. I think he actually comes uses reason to show why it's it just seems unlikely that these programs generate a net surplus that they can make us all better off. Um, he makes and then he shows well in the case of roads, you can see why it would. Although I don't know if he uses data for all those, but the point is, he, I think he uses reasoning to critique these this panoply of alphabet agencies in the federal government. Similar to the way I critique IP, like mine is partly burden of proof, partly I'm relying upon all the studies that have been done. Like economists have been trying for 75 years to to study this, and they always conclude that look, you just don't have any evidence, or it, it seems it seems like it actually dampens innovation. So it's it's a they keep saying the system is broken, but they've been saying that for 50 years. Yeah. At a certain point in time, it's like it's not broken. This is the way the system works, you know. Um, so the point is, he's just not applying his own methodology, but the thing is, if you had this ad hoc approach, then even if I – and so he did the exact thing that's the problem. Like I, I, I first went through all the studies, and then I gave like a bunch of examples of just horror stories of how copyright and patent have been applied, and the result has been just an obvious injustice. Like everyone in the audience would agree it's obviously unjust, and Epstein seemed to agree with all of those. But he's like, well, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So this is the problem yeah. if you don't have a principled approach. Even if I give examples illustrating it, um, they're just going to say, well, yeah, but that's not the system. I'm in, I'm in favor of a system that's reformed and gets rid of those rough edges but preserves the core beneath that's really good. Yeah. So you, there's no way to argue against that in a in a 45-minute presentation when they're just going to keep hitting you with well what about poets what about what about authors of novels what about f documentary filmmakers what about uh, an employee who wants to start a startup and needs to sell his i mean they're just going to come up with one example after the other and even if you answer all those they'll just keep coming up with more they'll never be satisfied and the way i had the word that the resolution to entice epstein to do it to make it easy for him to win was all patent and copyright should be abolished. So all he had to do was put a little bit of like reasonable doubt that like, yeah, yeah. yeah Kinsella might be right that everything he mentioned is a problem, and we should radically reform the patent system and the copyright system. But that doesn't show we should abolish all of it because maybe there's a core left, and Epstein seems to think that at least on occasion there's these market failures that patent and copyright law can solve. So that was the uphill battle I was facing, which was fine with me. Well, and, and I was just actually going to push back a little bit on the, the way you presented or the examples cited um, against the, the abuses of intellectual property or copyright. So, I mean, I agree they're all horrible, but in terms of persuading the audience, it, it, 
very few of them probably had the effect of changing minds. So for example, a lot of them were, well, this person did this and they went to jail or they were fined because they violated this copyright, which we would say, yeah, that's ridiculous. But to someone who believes in copyright say, well, yeah, of course they should yeah. have been fined or gone to jail because they broke the law. I mean, yeah. And Ep of Epstein, course, copyright, they, they were stealing value. So of course, so why? Yeah. Why, and Epstein, bad thing. So yeah, Epstein, really only a couple where it was like, Oh my God. Yeah. That's really actually horrible. <laughs> that's, that's, that's correct. It's, it's yeah. sort of, I won't say question begging, but it's like, if you view it as a property, right. That's justified. Yeah. Then, then you, say, sure. you have to enforce it because, and that's what Epstein says about injunctions. Like he says, well, uh, if you have a property, right, you need to have an injunction to enforce it. Whereas to me, an injunction for copyright and patent is one of the worst things because yeah. it makes the effect so much harsher. Um, yeah, so I think the example you had about Ford, that, that was probably the best one because it basically said, look, we have this patent. Well, the patent holders are able to restrict other auto manufacturers from using these safety, safety measures. Yeah, yeah. Literally cost people lives. Yes. Liter they literally did. So that one, I, I don't see how they could argue back against that other than, you know, just, well, on net, you know, okay, you got to break a few eggs, I guess, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it, that is true. That is one. That's one drawback of just citing outrage is because um, if and not only that, lots of people don't have a – they don't have this view that a lot of us have. Like I view that all rights are com what Hillel Steiner called compossible, which means – and like Ayn Rand had this view that rights can't conflict actually. If you properly identify and allocate rights, which are always property rights, then they – it's impossible for human – interest to truly conflict because there's a property system that identifies who's the owner of a given conflictable thing. So there is so but most people don't think that way. They think that there's always um, there's always a possibility of a, a conflict of interest and the law has to sometimes compromise and balance these things, which is what Epstein's view is like with respect to um, like I pointed out um, that the Copyright Act, restricts freedom of the press because it prevents you from publishing certain things, which the First Amendment says Congress can't do. So on a facial reading of the First Amendment, it it would prohibit the Copyright Act from being enacted because it it restricts freedom of speech and freedom of the press. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so what the Supreme Court has done and what Epstein seems to believe is that you have to balance these interests. Like they're competing interests, and the court, that's what the job of the courts is. Like in the old days, the job of courts was to do justice, to like find the owner of a resource in the case of a dispute about a resource in a fair way. <laughs> now the now the job of the court is to interpret statutes that compete with the, that are in conflict with each other because they're just decrees of a committee, and there's no guarantee that they're consistent with each other. So it makes it look like our rights are in conflict and in tension and not always compossible. Because everyone's a legal positivist now, and they think that law is – the only source of our rights is the law, and the law comes from a legislature, which is just decrees of bureaucrats, and there's no guarantee that they're consistent with each other or even that they're just. So that's what the job of the courts are now is to balance competing interests. Like antitrust law, people admit that antitrust law is in tension with patent law because patent law grants monopolies, and the antitrust law outlaws monopolies. Right. So the courts say, well… You can't you can't subject someone to liability under the antitrust law for merely having a patent because the government has issued the patent. But if they go too far and abuse it, then that's an antitrust problem. So they try to balance these conflicting provisions. It's the same with copyright in the First Amendment. Um, and Epstein seems to buy into that too. So this is again the problem with an ad hoc, unprincipled, non proprietary yeah, well, yeah. approach to and things. That's what happens when you essentially try to within the law legislate preferences rather than principles to the extent that you could legislate principles but these are basically just preferences well we want competition but not too much you know we we we, and we, we don't want um you know basically these these big companies to collude and and harm harm the uh to the consumer but maybe if they collude just a little bit and benefit them then that's okay so they're trying to balance all all these things and it's really it's just not possible but they i guess through through the court system it's imagined that well we can treat all of these on a case by case basis and and a certain class of individual in society can can kind of act as a grand overseer and and, and guide the ship and make sure that everything is is as we prefer it to be well what's what's astounding is they have this idea of 
So the, the Chicago types have this idea of ideal or perfect competition, which is unrealistic. And the problem with that is when the real free market doesn't live up to their idea of perfect competition and instant transmission, instant costless transmission of knowledge, all this stuff, then they call it a market failure and justify intervention to stop it. So they come up with an unrealistic model of that's the ideal. And when, when the real free market doesn't comply with it, then they want to they want to tweak it to become more ideal, even though it's not realistic. I mean, the whole thing is corrupt. But what's what's ironic is so their their ideal is perfect competition. And yet their argument for patent and copyright is that competition itself is a market failure. So it's like they're willing to tolerate competition when it's difficult. So if you if you're an entrepreneur and you come up with a, a brick and mortar business. Then, if it's successful, you will you will attract comp competition. People will start competing with you, and they'll drive your cost down to the marginal cost of production over time. This this is how the market works. Right. Uh, so it becomes more difficult for you to make a profit if you're the first guy. You can make a profit more easily at first because you're the first guy, but then when you attract competition, it gets harder and harder to make a profit doing what you were doing. So it's just the way it goes. But in intellectual goods and services that is things like the patent and copyright cover inventions and 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 creative works things where the the market value of the good or service is heavily dependent upon its its arrangement its pattern which means that in some cases competition is much easier than it is for a brick and mortar because i mean if if i if i'm if my business model is writing a book and selling the book it's very easy in today's technology for someone to copy the book so competition is very easy and quick, and this bothers the the Chicago guys because competition apparently, if it's too easy, is a market failure to them because it doesn't allow you to recoup your costs. I mean, that's their focus is recouping costs, all, you know, all over the time. So that's what's ironic is that they want to they want to force a realm of human action, the idea, the knowledge aspect, which which we're lucky that that is a non-scarce resource because we can replicate and copy and all use this information and all have successful human action because we can use this knowledge freely. They want to subject it to the type of scarcity that's naturally part of the scarce means, the conflictable means of action. So they want to slow – they explicitly say they want to slow down the spread of knowledge so that there will be more knowledge to, to be created in the first place. It's, yeah, it's, well, it's so much social engineering. It's incredible. Yeah, and it's kind of uh... – counter not counterintuitive but it's uh, it's uh it's kind of what's the word um basically the, the two things are uh, working against each other so the idea is that well we're gonna for ip we're gonna give you a monopoly over this idea because by having the monopoly that will incentivize you that will incentivize production of different things whether it's new inventions or the arts however so by having this monopoly right we incentivize production and competition but on the flip side, they say, well, if we didn't have this, then there would be a monopoly, and that would represent market failure, and then that would decrease competition. So it's like, I don't, it doesn't really make any sense that, well, if we impose this system, it's going to incentivize these benefits to the market system, this production of new goods and services and inventions. And if we lack it, then the same thing will happen naturally, but we won't get these ancillary benefits so it's kind of it's contradictory in that way yeah i think it's almost um well, someone sent me a note after and they, they thought that like it was striking Epstein's answer to what what i thought was a pretty good gotcha because he he seemed to concede that the original copyright system that was called the founder's copyright like 14 year terms may be extendable once so 28 years now it's 140 or something roughly he seemed to concede that the original term is about right and that 140 years is way too long. Yeah. Um, so you know, I asked him, I said, well, I understand you'd prefer 14 years to zero, but apparently when you have a copyright system, it will grow and metastasize and turn into a 100-plus year system. So I don't think a 30-year or a 14-year term is not feasible. It's like it's – like, it's like saying minarchy is possible. There's different minarchy states always turn into into mega states. Yeah. So there's no, there's no reason to think it's possible to have a, a small copyright term. It will always grow because a special interest behind it will always push for it, and the public will be confused and they'll go along with it. Yeah. Um, so I said, 
if your choice was 140 years or zero, what would you choose? Because zero is closer to 14 years than 140 is, right? Yeah. And he says, I would still take 140. And someone wrote me and said, that's just amazing because that doesn't even make sense from his point of view. Right. Um, I, I don't even understand how he could say that. It seems like he would – he could give me that one without losing the debate. He could say, well, I would rather zero than 140. Well, I, I think he's – I think there might have been a question in the audience about that or something came up later. Basically, he said that, well, it, it the 140 is not as harmful as it appears because most of the yeah. value is derived in the first seven or 14 years. And after that, there's, there's very, very little value from the original author after that point. And so on net, society isn't really losing anything because anyone that would try to copy it after that time frame would only be able to gain that, that gain that residual. So it, it doesn't yeah. really matter. Of course, of course. I mean, he I mean, you know, there is the orphan works problem, which is that, you know, yeah. over over time works people just don't republish these works because they could be sued for massive right. copyright infringement. Yeah. Yeah. So they just disappear. So there, yeah, there there might be no market 50 years yeah. later. Yeah. So there's no incentive for the the original copyright holder or their heirs to even monitor it and get permission or even be able to be findable. So no no publisher can republish it because they don't even know who to contact. Right. Um, so but it hey, becomes but, a black market. But, but if it's the resale market, so there's a lot of these uh, books that are off. Uh, I guess I don't know if they're off. The, the original publisher doesn't publish it anymore, and I don't know if it's off, I guess not off copyright, but. They just refuse to publish it or they can't be found. Some, some, some publishing agreements have a reversion clause, right, where like yeah. if it goes out of print for a certain amount of time, the rights revert back to the author yeah. or to his heirs, and that, that's fine. But, but you still don't always know how to track them down or who they are, and if the book is just so out of demand, I mean it would be great if you could have Google Books do what they originally wanted and just have everything up like Project Gutenberg it, it, that's out of print. But yeah. they're not out of copyright yet, so they can't right. do that right. because they'll be sued by authors' unions and authors' guilds and things like this, even right. though the original copyright holders are nowhere to be found and don't even know about it, don't even care. Yeah, and there's an obvious demand for it because if you look for some of these books, the only ones you can get are the original used ones, and some of them can be several hundreds if not thousands of dollars. So obviously somebody wants them. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so – I don't know. I thought uh, I don't remember. We had we you and I talked a lot about it that night. We had more ideas. We probably forgot now. But um, yeah. uh, was, well, I had well. There was one. Was, there was two others. Was one I was going to bring up, um, and this was a point I was going to make. Actually, I guess when I had my introduction, I didn't bring up that my background is in chemistry. I have a PhD in organic chemistry, um, so I'm familiar with how research universities function and, and that whole environment. And one of the things that, that struck me quite a bit was uh, Epstein uh, in his opening statement. Um, he basically talks about how, and this is one of the tropes that everyone uses, they always go to drugs because they always seem, oh, well, these companies are gonna spend billions of dollars developing this drug. And then it's just gonna be easily copied. And that's what he said. He said, a billion dollars to develop a drug, reverse engineered quite easily, right. and then they lose it. And I'm here to say, no, I'm a chemist yep. and I've worked in a lab and I know how this whole process works. It is not quite easily. Yeah, that's completely, I agree. I mean, it's completely false. I mean, it's at the point where we have journal articles telling us how to make these things and we have problems making them. <laughs> so it is it's not trivial. Now, yes, granted, you're going to have, you, you throw a lot of people behind it trying to reverse engineer it, but it, it's very difficult because a lot of what drug development is, is that we'll look to nature and find natural products and it takes it can take up to a year or more simply to get a structure on the thing, just to see what it is. Well, and not only not, now you have to come up with a pathway, a chemical pathway to produce it first produce in the lab. And then it might be a completely different pathway if you're going to do it at an industrial scale. So it, there, there's no way is it an easy process at all. Best, best case, if someone came up with some new you know, drug and they reverse engineered it, maybe five years, maybe. That yeah. They'd be able well, to and the, well, not only that, um, my understanding is that even if you knew exactly how to make the chemical to make the pill, right? That yeah. apparently some generics are not as good as the name brands because right. of the way the pill is formulated and the way it's absorbed in your body and the way that the quality control is done. Um, so quite often the insurance companies make you take the generic and you have to get special permission to take the name brand one because it's actually better. Even though there's no patent anymore and all that, it's like it's just it's simply not that easy. But by the way, this is true. 
And if you could persuade Epstein and these guys, they would they would view that as a good thing. They say, okay, I can breathe a sigh of relief. The pharmaceutical industry doesn't have easy competition. That's a great thing. I mean, it's actually not a good thing. It's just a fact, yeah. right? Yeah. Like their argument is wrong. But it would be a good thing if it was if it was easy. Like if we had more competition, it would be good. That's not a bad thing. It would change business models, but that's not a bad thing. Like right. if the world, if the world of scarcity, of the world of scarce material resources was more like information, that would be a good thing because that's what it would mean to move into a world of near superabundance, right? The post scarcity idea, the thing when things are, the, the world when things are cheaper. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. So, right. right. This is what we want. We want people to we, copy drugs. We, we, we should, months. we should, we should not want to make knowledge more scarce by, by, by imposing artificial scarcity to make it more like the world of, of, of scarce physical resources. We should want the world of physical resources to become more abundant. Like information and knowledge are. That's what we. That's the goal: is to have more economic productivity and more wealth. Right, right. We don't want more more barriers in place, and so that's that's another area where it's contradictory because uh, the, the claim is made that basically, well, the the the, the, um, the patent bargain is that well, we give you this period of exclusive rights, and you disclose how your invention is made. Okay, so that's so the world benefits from that because now we have this information about how this, this drug or device, however it's constructed, so that when it goes off patent, then we can all benefit from this. But it's sort and of even even before e even before it goes off patent, so like you publish okay, the patent yeah. right away. But then the, so the, the, even though you can't make the product, you can start experimenting and learning from it, and you can be, get ready to do something else when the patent expires. Yeah. Right. Right. So, but I find it contradictory because the claim is, well, we need this in order to disclose this. Otherwise, we'd have all these trade secrets and this information yes. would not be out there. However, the flip side is he's saying, but if we don't have the patents, then these things will be easily copied. So, which one is it? These things can be easily copied by yes. everyone. No, that's exactly the patent in order to disclose it so that we can easily copy it at some point later. No, that, and there's been studies on this, which I have on my C4SAF blog. Um, uh, it's like the misunderstood function of disclosure. So basically, most people think that the patent bargain. And by the way, Epstein mentioned the copyright okay, bargain. Yeah, I think he's yeah. there's no copyright bargain. Okay. There's I a patent bargain. If you had figured it, because you asked him, I don't. I've never heard of that, and I didn't know. No, it. he. Yeah, I think okay. he just. He's he's not a he's not a practicing patent attorney. He's okay. he's a law professor and he's a consultant. He's not a registered patent attorney. I don't think he understands in detail how people that practice it do it. Um, but uh, uh, most people think that. The government grants you a monopoly to incentivize production, but technically speaking, that might be an argument behind it. But the way the law is written, the, the patent bargain is we're going to give you a monopoly if you disclose how to do it, and, and the argument there is that you would otherwise keep it secret. But the problem with that argument is, is this. Um, for most types of products, when you sell it on the market, you, ought, you necessarily reveal – the the design. I mean, people see it. Yeah. For most things, you can you can easily copy it and reverse engineer it if it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so for those types of products, they couldn't keep it as a trade secret if they want to sell it. So when you give them an op a monopoly on it to reveal the way it's made, uh, you're giving them a monopoly for doing nothing because they would have yeah. revealed how it's made anyway. Yeah, you figured out anyway. And, and for the rare types of innovations. That you can keep as a trade secret, like let's say you uh, come up with a new um, a new process for mixing chemicals in a, in a in a chemical plant or, or a refinery or something, um, that allows you to make this product like gasoline or something like that. It it allows you to make it more efficiently, more cheaply, so you can undercut your 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 competitors. The gasoline you're selling is not patentable because it's the same product. But you made it in a more efficient way, and you don't need to sell the nozzle or the or the mixing method when you sell it. So those things you're able to keep as a secret, and in those cases, you probably still keep it a secret. So in the cases where you 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 disclose is probably cases where you had to disclose it anyway. So the public's not getting anything back. Okay. So it's just it's just it's just yeah. so it's all upside. It's all a make weight argument <laughs> to perpetuate the monopoly some industries have have grown reliant upon. Um, one other thing I was going to touch on, I wasn't sure if you if, if you were familiar with it because I don't recall if you touched on it or not. Was the he kept citing the the Bayh Dole 
agreement or standard. I guess it was something in the early 80s. And so that was kind of how he tried to underpin his argument that, well, we had the system where everything was in the public domain and nobody wanted to produce any drugs. Nobody wanted to compete. No one wanted to do anything. And so they changed something at some point and said, okay, yeah. well, now, now we can have these agreements. And then everyone started producing all these drugs. But to me, the, 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 the argument back would have been, well, how long was that for? And did they all know that this was probably going to expire anyways, and we would return to the status quo of a patent system? So of course, if you tell them, well, for five years, we're not going to impose any sort of patents. Okay, well, we'll just wait five years until the yeah. time runs out, and then we'll go back. But I wasn't, I'm well, not familiar with that law or system. Or well, I'm, I'm not real familiar with it. It has something to do with uh, who owns patents when government's funding the research and all this kind of stuff. And it's an, it, it, it's an interplay between the FDA drug approval system and the patent system but you know first of all you could as i pointed out briefly uh, switzerland and italy for like 40 50 years in the in the 19 in the in the 19th in the 20th century didn't have a patent system that covered pharmaceuticals and they were like among the world leaders of pharmaceuticals so right. it's not like we all of a sudden had pharmaceutical produced because of by dole i think epstein just does a lot of uh, relying upon its own authority and hand waving. Most people don't know what Bayh-Dole is, and when Epstein says, "Oh, the uh, the 1950 something Patent Act was written by these two brilliant patent lawyers," how does he know? He's not even a patent lawyer. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's just ridiculous. It, and and he acts like, "Oh, we now have the Obama patent system." The Obama America Invents Act did not replace the 1952 Patent Act. It just made some amendments to it, and they're all trivial. Like the biggest change was it changed the who the in the case of a conflict like two independent inventors under the old system in the U.S. it was first first to invent. Like if if two guys filed for patent applications on different dates, the first guy to file wouldn't necessarily win if there was an interference proceeding. It would be the guy that could prove he had conceived of it first. Okay, most of the rest of the world has a first to file system, and under the Obama. American Invents Act in 2009, I think, um, they changed it to first to file, so we're more like the rest of the world. So, But it's trivial. It doesn't make a difference because those things are very rare. There's like 20 or 30 proceedings a year under the old act. It, it, it From the public's point of view, it doesn't matter if A or B has the patent, right? So it's it's totally irrelevant. It, it didn't change the, 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 the structure. Now, what has changed the patent system a little bit has been some court cases, not the not the Obama Act. And court cases going back and forth on patch, stat, statutory subject matter, like can you patent business methods, and whether you can have an injunction issued to protect your patent grant. They've made it a little bit harder to get an injunction, which to my view is a good thing because it takes some of the teeth out, but to Epstein, it's, a, it's, it's bad. But that was because of the Supreme Court. That wasn't because of Obama's act. So he's just wrong. Uh, so he just – so my view is that he seems to be critical of the FDA. But because it's so intertwined with government funding and research and the Bayh-Dole Act and uh, the forced disclosure that it, the, the FDA process makes you do and the extra costs it adds and then increases your, your inability to recoup your cost, it increases the so-called need for patents as a patch to fix the problem caused by the FDA system in the first place. But he seems to oppose most of the FDA system. But he's still in favor of the patent system anyway. I mean, I think I talked to Rich to Gene Epstein, the the the, the host and the moderator and the, the founder of the debate series, uh, but either before or after. Um, I begrudgingly conceded, mostly for the sake of argument, because I don't really quite mean this. But I said, look, because some people say, Stefan, you're against the patent system, and you're right that that the that the FDA system is bad too independently, but would you concede that as long as we have the FDA, we need the patent system? Because the FDA imposes all these costs on companies, makes it harder for them to recoup their costs because it increases the cost, and it also lengthens the time to market, which re reduces their lead time, and it also forces them to disclose their chemical formulas during the process so that their generics are ready to go right. quicker. Yeah. So it reduces their natural lead time they would have on a real free market. So would you concede that we need patents? Like in other words, we can't abolish patents until we abolish the FDA. Now, I actually don't believe that because I think that the role of patents is misunderstood and that things would 
we should independently abolish each. But I said, okay, I would I would grant you one thing. I would be okay with this because it would be a move in the right direction. Yes. The the majority of cost caused by the FDA is not the innovation itself. Like I, I think I've read that the the mRNA vaccines came up will come up with in a very short time because the technology is there. It was it was it was doing the clinical trials and all this, which is not the patentable stuff. So, and the FDA imposes all these clinical trial requirements and all this kind of stuff. So I would say that so long as the FDA is basically restricting you from selling a drug unless they grant you a license, and the license, basically the cost of the license is is not really the innovation itself, but it's the clinical trials they force you to go through. Um, so let's say they cost half a billion dollars, and you get a drug going, and then a generic says, okay, we've got our facilities ready to go, and they ask the FDI, would you extend the license to us? I would be okay if the FDA would say, okay, you can. we're going to give you a license, but you have to share the cost of the clinical trials the first company had to do. Right. So like, let's say the first company had spent half a billion then the, the generic would have to fork over some fork over half of that. And then if a third one comes up, they'd have to fork over a third and give it right, to right. the other guys. Right, right. To me, I'd be perfectly fine with that. It wouldn't be ideal, but right, but, but that would that would alleviate all the concerns of these guys that the FDA process imposes these costs and you need patents to solve it. Don't solve it with a patent, solve it by equally applying this license requirement to everyone equally so that it's a more of a level playing field, something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Like that, I think that would be a reason. I've never heard anyone propose that. I think that would be a reasonable yeah, uh, yeah, I've never heard regulatory uh, uh, fix, and it would be fairly minor too. Just instead of having the FDA grant the generic uh, the license so they can instantly compete with the first guy who had to pay all these costs that the FDA required, make them share it. Just make them yeah. make everyone the share counter, the cost. I think the only counter argument would be, well, they're, they're, you know, there's generic com countries, com companies in other countries, and they would just, you know, they're in India. They'll just make it, you know, regardless, they'll just ignore it. They don't care. So, well, yeah, but the patent system doesn't fit the, doesn't fix that anyway, because uh, if they don't have a patent, then the patent system will stop it. And, but they probably do have a patent because these pharmaceutical companies for a billion dollar, uh, drug, they they can afford to file the patent in multiple countries, so they will file it in India too. So they would have a patent there anyway. Yeah, yeah. I so guess you, end up, you end up with a hodgepodge system. So that I don't know how that would. It's well, I idea. think what would happen it's is so idea, you, but in practice, yeah. So if you have well, we have this system in, in the U.S. where you have to share the cost, but in in these other countries, you have a you know the old style patent system. Well, I mean, uh, the FDA only national corporation. So yeah, what, yeah. What, what rules are they going to follow? But the FDA only governs the U.S. I mean, you can't you can't make the FDA govern the whole world through the United Nations. So <laughs> I'm simply saying that 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 would be so probably what you'd have is you'd have like a first and a second and a third American generic would pop up and. After after a while, they would all be sharing one fourth of that cost. Yeah, and after five or ten are doing it, then they're sharing one tenth the cost. So maybe then an Indian or Chinese company would 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 do it. And I don't know if their FDA would would require something similar. But anyway, I think it would be an improvement. But um, one thing I was also going to say, I think that one 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 reason that these these the old guard like Epstein and the the old school libertarians. And so-called free market. The reason they're all in favor of the patent system is basically they're stuck in the old analog way of thinking. Like they are used to a world from the 1900s, the Industrial Revolution, when things were mechanical and analog and physical, and competition worked a certain way. And they're just used to the incentive structure that that developed in the free market in those days. Like that's how they understood economics. Like. Yeah. Uh, you come up with a new idea. You get some investors. You build your facilities. Um, if your product is successful, you can charge what you could think of as a monopoly price for a while because you have no competition at first. You gradually attract competition, but the incentives all align and blah, blah, blah. So that's how they're used to thinking of things. And when the information age started, they just tried to shoehorn that into their analog age. They want it to. They want the world to fit their models instead of adapting their models to fit the changing world. And I do think that maybe the younger generation will become more and more skeptical of of IP because the younger people are used to file sharing. They're used to open source software, right? They understand that you don't need a monopoly on your software to develop good software. In fact, I guess over half or most of it is 
good software is done using the semi open source model, right? Right. So I do think that maybe just it's the old fogies need to just die out and <laughs> and the modern yeah. generation will become more amenable to anti IP ideas. Yeah. I mean, I think in particularly with um, music file sharing, that type of thing, young people, like they, they want to access the music. They want it to be free. They don't want to, you know, pay too much, but they understand that there is an artist that's producing it. And so they're very amenable to kind of some of these new methods of yes. the artists compensating. Yeah. Which the artists have been forced to do because of the, you know, the collapse of the, the old yeah. recording industry style system. So you can have patrons and you can have, you know, special supporter levels and whatever. And, and they're more than happy to spend that as long as they keep getting their free or cheap music or through Spotify where it's, it's kind of commoditized and it's like, you know, it's a fixed cost and I can get as much as I want. And, you know, so they're, they're, they're very amenable to that. I, I, I don't think there's, there's very few out there that are like, well, it shall be free and I should never have to pay for it ever. They obviously understand that somebody is producing it. So it's, it's really essentially kind of a free market but the free market has been forced to sort of solve this problem because the, the technology, the te technological barriers just kind of destroyed the old, the old system. Yeah. And I think that's teaching these people. It's a teaching moment, sort of like the collapse of communism was a teaching moment. People yeah. are generally skeptical of centrally planned economies now, although we, it creeps back up on us, but in abstract, they, they understand it better than they did in 1970. Um, you know, these young people see these warnings at the beginning of of movies like it's an FBI offense to copy this movie, but are all these stupid PR these these public service announcements like you wouldn't download you wouldn't download someone's car? It's like, uh, yeah, you would <laughs> if you could have three D printing make a car. You actually would download a car, yeah. <laughs> or, uh, you know. So they laugh at this stuff now. Just like just like most young people don't think that marijuana is like, come on, marijuana is not right, some right. life destroying. What do they call it in the in the fifties? Zombie weed or <laughs> killer killer weed or your reefer madness? Yes, like everyone laughs at that stuff now. So I, I I have some optimism, and the big optimism is that like like you said, copyright is almost a dead letter because of, I mean, you can get the big companies because they're they're subject to the jurisdiction of the courts, but every day average millions of billions of users just torrenting and file sharing encrypted files, you know. It's it's yeah. done. It's copyright's already hard to enforce, and my hope, as I've said many times, maybe I'm naive about this. I'm curious what you think, but my hope is that 3D printing, which I think we're in the dot matrix phase. We're not even in the dot matrix phase. Like if you analogize it to the way printers developed, yeah. when I was young, there were line printers and dot matrix printers, and then they finally became ink jets, and then laser jets, and then color laser jets, and they were all hyper expensive, but now they're great, right? right. Um, I think I hope something like that can happen with 3D printing, although I think it's going to take a long time. But I could imagine a future, say 50 years from now, when lots of advanced things can be 3D printed on a relatively inexpensive 3D printer. What do you think about that? Uh, I think, yeah, there's possibilities. I mean, I see a lot of some science fiction. I don't uh, know enough about the, the topic to really comment intelligently on it. But, you know, things are like programmable matter and, and sort of these kind of nanoscale devices i well if you get to the point of, where you could print a chemist, house I, I don't i don't really see how that would function because it's it's very easy to write about you know from a science science fiction standpoint but there's, it might not be efficient economically yeah, I, I, I just don't see how that would happen i know you know kind of the, the, the star trek approach to, you know sort of things where you have these mat um the replicators like that's sort of the idea where we can just take energy and we just can turn it yeah. into anything um well, if you could make food with it, and if energy is basically plentiful because of nuclear or some other innovation in energy, I don't know. Maybe it's still it, mass it, production it, is better, but mass production can be regulated. That's just like centralization in, in cryptocurrency. Like that's the problem with mass production; it can be regulated, but yeah, everyone I, can I, do what they want on their own. Yeah, I think these things can be made more efficient, and yeah, and, and methods can be developed where you can, you know, for example, maybe we could pull metals uh, out of the ocean much more efficiently so we wouldn't need to mine anymore and it would become incredibly cheap to have unlimited amounts of steel titanium gold whatever and through that method now we can uh, construct these devices in a much more efficient way so i think there's no ends to how much more efficient these processes can become but i just i i, I don't foresee there ever being a world where you're just going to snap your fingers and there's you know you can have a, a car suddenly appears in your yeah i i suppose <laughs> 
it might be r- roughly free because robots might make it in big factories. But um, yeah. but yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and I guess to, yeah. The, the main reason to have your own 3D printer would be to evade patent law, which probably won't be enough economic motive. Although you could uh, – I think even at the beginning of COVID, I, I heard this story. Uh, I think it was partly debunked, but it's a good illustration. These ventilators are in short supply, and there was some part that you needed to replace, some little cheap like plastic connector part, you know, yeah. like a $2 thing. Yeah. But because it was part of a patented system or something – and it was in scarce supply, and it was like you know five thousand bucks or something crazy. Right. So someone just three D started three D printing a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. So I, it, it's an example think, of how, in a certain narrow cases, three D printing could let you evade the negative impact of of patents patent imposed scarcity. I think. Yeah, I think there's some some devices, some materials that are amenable to that sort of thing, but then some some are not, some that are not yet. Like, right. So I'm I'm imagining 50 parts years from now, and, and interconnected components, um, chemicals, things like that, chemical mixtures, food. Yeah. I don't see how you're you're gonna print that, um, in any. But you know, you you never know. Maybe maybe 10,000 years, 50,000 years, man. <laughs> that that's kind of that's more my time horizon. If if, if such a thing is possible, where we can yeah. Basically, yeah. you'd have to manipulate, be able to ma- manipulate matter on the subatomic scale. And yeah, you're, you're if such a thing is possible, then all you, bets are off. But I, I don't see that anytime. You're, you know, you're too much of a realist to be a libertarian because libertarians hate when you're a realist. Like when you say, <laughs> "Yeah, we're gonna have liberty in maybe 500 years," they get pissed off. Like, no, I want it tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. And when they don't achieve it, then they stamp their feet and they 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 leave libertarianism and they they work with the they work with the alt right or post-libertarianism or something like yeah anyway um, um I'm trying to think one other thing i was going to bring up Let's see. well i think one of the things that you could have stressed a little bit more in the debate that we did talk about afterward was the the mentioning of i think you said patents um, cost upwards of a hundred billion dollars a year and yeah that that and actually i did i rewatched it you actually did pointed out um but you probably should have hammered on that a bit more which was that you know basically well okay it costs 100 billion but are we getting 300 billion in output well that's not really clear that that's the case but i think people need to understand it's like well yeah if if you just did away with this whole system that's 100 billion dollars yes. that could be put toward yeah new innovation yeah you know, training people into new fields what, whatever well it's just essentially just wasted on lawyers right it's now. the it's the broken window fallacy it's the scene in the unseen which yeah. i think I, I alluded to but yeah i could have hammered that home you know hoppa wrote me after and he had a really good point which i thought of before but i never really i don't know if i put it down you know hans point hans is such a praxeologist such an austrian so so epstein's argument like was like um well there will be some um <laughs> <laughs> there'll be some innovations uh, that are just not economically viable without the patent system, right? Yeah. And and some of the people in the audience were saying something similar about like artistic work, like, well, why would why would I write a novel if I if people can knock me off? <laughs> and I had point for novels, I did point out like, well, I mean, there's massive piracy right now, and yet we have an abundance of stuff. And Hans was like, yeah, maybe we have too much shit. You know, <laughs> we have too much crap out there. I mean, would we really be worse off if like one third of this crap that's being produced now wasn't, yeah, wasn't produced? I mean, really? No. But his point on the pharmaceuticals and other things was like, it's kind of it's it's sort of um, similar to the point we're making about uh, the opportunity cost of these programs, like the seen and the unseen. Yeah, if the patent system costs 100 billion a year, that's taking resources away from people that they would have done something else with, right? right. And so you don't know what that was because it's, it's it never exists, but you're hurting us in that way. But Hans's point is like, well, you know, by demonstrated preference and the way that the, the free market works, if if a, if an entrepreneur thinks of a of a given pharmaceutical project or some other business project that he can't make a profit of, of, that's a sign he shouldn't do it. But the patent system is artificially making you do something that is basically a malinvestment. You're investing too much money in something because the patent system allows you to. So it's a malinvestment. And yeah, I mean, because the argument, I don't know if I made it in the debate, but um, 
some people like Alex Tabarrok and, and some socialists um, have argued let's replace or augment the patent system with a prize system. Like instead of giving people government granted monopolies to let them charge a monopoly price to recoup their cost, we just tax people and we give them these big prizes. Um, and he 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 recommended like tens of billions of dollars for pharmaceuticals. And I did the math, like, yeah, but the patent system covers more than pharmaceuticals. So if you if you generalize that proposal to cover everything the patent system is supposed to incentivize, we're talking two, three, four trillion a year or more. Yeah. Which is more than we tax people right now. But the point is, so if you say that, okay, we have this level of innovation right in a free market without the patent system because market failure, but the optimum is here. And if we have a patent system, we can get closer to that optimum. Well, there's still drugs up here that we're not creating because they're still not economically viable, even with the patent system. So we should tax people in addition to that to get ever. It's like the goal of it's like these people think the goal of the economy is to just pick some random variable and maximize it. Like, like instead of the goal of law being justice, the goal of law is to maximize innovation. The, but where where did that become the goal of law to maximize innovation? Because everything comes at a cost. If you maximize innovation, you might reduce standards of living, right, or comfort, or lifespan, or or or, or whatever. Right. The same, and the same thing I kind of you know, reflect on after the debate was what, why, why is there a goal to maximize the arts, music, literature, books, whatever? What, why is it right. even the government's interest at all to maximize these things as though and somehow it, they, I, I mean, I could, you know, just for the sake of argument, I could wrap my head around why they would have a patent system. Okay, well, there's going to be inventions and drugs that are going to raise our standard of living. These are useful functional devices that, that enhance standard of living. Right. Okay. Yeah. You can say, well, the arts does the same thing, but not really in the same no, way. And, no. and, and it, it's, it's like, you can live without this movie or this song, you can still survive. And it's not like without it, they simply wouldn't exist. I mean, I think that's just completely irrational to believe Correct. that. And, 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 even if, and, and, and the evidence exists is that, like you said, the real world right now, copyright is essentially a dead letter for many of the things, particularly music. And yet people still produce these these songs and most of them, 99% don't go anywhere. So basically there's still this huge, there's still an incentive to produce it, even though the chance that you're going to win, that you're going to be the one that, you know, gets the copyright and you're, you become successful is, is extremely limited. So it's. Yeah. And not, and not only that, I mean, even if we stopped production of new artistic works, which is impossible, I mean, right. maybe you cut it by half, let's say, which is not even possible, but let's say you cut it by half. Even if you stopped it, I mean, there's so much accumulated culture that we, I mean, there's billions of stuff out there. Right. No one in their lifetime can ever go through it. So, in a sense, we have we have a reservoir of artistic stuff that books, movies, you know, we actually have enough to live on for our whole lives right. already. And, yeah, but, no, but, but you ask any artist why why do you do this? No, none of them ever say, "Oh, it's for the money." <laughs> no, and, and it's are passionate. That's their nature. That's why they produce their art. That's yes, and it's, it's that's also uh, they're there's, not going to do it because there's no chance that they can copyright. It's, it's absurd. Yeah, and on my C4SIF, I have an, another uh, post about uh, a study, an analysis done by I think Devlin, but uh, it's called the called the myth, the myth of patent law, and it's related to that um, uh, the one about the myth about patent disclosure. But the, the other myth is that people do things for economic. Or for catalactic or monetary incentives, but it's not even true for inventions. Like, first of all, most people invent because they're passionate about this scientific area. They want to do it, just like people write novels for their own reasons, usually, and, and yeah. paint paintings. Um, or they they do do it for economic reasons, but it's because they're selling a product or they have a business and they want to improve their product so they can get more customers. Yeah. So they're not doing it. In fact, I, I prosecuted. I, I've lost count. Probably over a thousand patents over the years from dozens of companies, and I've interviewed in every time I, in, I interview the engineers who invented. I don't think I've ever once seen any clear reason to believe that the invention that these guys came up with they came up with because they know that there's a patent system that gives them a reward for it. They come up with the inventions because they're trying to solve a problem to make their product better. Like, oh, I want to make this laser – like my customer wants this laser to have a, yeah. a cleaner signal. And so to do that, I've got to move this lens over from here to here. But to do that, I've got to find a way to attach it 
and no one's been able to figure out. So they think about it. Like, oh, here's how I attach it. Oh, we have a patent lawyer on staff. Let's file a patent on it while we're doing because we might, that might be worth something to our investors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they didn't invent it because of a patent system. They simply filed a patent because it's a patent system. But the invention came because they needed to solve a problem. And I think this is like 99.9% .9 of the case. Very rarely do people say, I'm going to sit down in a room and brainstorm and come up with ideas. Just because, well, actually, they do that. They, so you have engineers at a company, and they have brainstorming sessions, and sometimes the goal is to file patents, but they're just doing that to stop competitors from competing with them and to have a big wall of patents. To, so it's a game, but it's not really true innovation. It's just it's just noise. Right, it's, and it's actually more harmful. They're coming up with a lot of good ideas that they have no intention of pursuing. Correct. If just get a patent on it. Then if anyone else has the same, like, basically – we're assuming that no one else would ever have the same idea. So if someone does, then we're all worse off because this company just came yes. up with the idea, patented, and then shelved it and has no yep. interest in doing and, it. And, and not only that, so the Rothbard and Milton Friedman point out like the one, one bad effect of the patent system is it distorts things. It skews innovation. I don't know how much of an effect that is, to be honest, because, again, I don't think people come up with inventions because of patents, and I actually don't think that they – I don't think the patent system stimulates innovation, but the, to the extent it does something, it does distort it. Um, so you could imagine a case where, and especially in pharmaceuticals. So, for example, I mean, I'm not a big expert on what do you call it, homeopathy or natural remedies and all this naturopathy or natural, but I, I do think there are some natural remedies that are just simply old, old remedies that are not patentable anymore, right? And pharmaceutical companies. They would prefer to have uh, a, pharma a pharmaceutical that is patentable because they can charge a higher price for it. Yeah. And given the quasi-socialized, messed up medical system we have, the prescription system and the insurance system, all these things play together to incentivize them to push – doctors push these new patentable things onto the public, which the insurers then pay for and the government subsidizes – and they're sometimes not as good or more dangerous than a natural remedy, but no one can make a, a lot of money off of that, so they don't. So just the existence of patents probably heavily distorts healthcare, right? It might be a more natural balance of new, innovative pharmaceuticals and old, time, you know, time-tested remedies. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think that's that's definitely the case because if uh, you know, you you can obviously you, basically the patent creates this false uh, basic high high you know monopoly privilege so that's where resources are going to be directed whereas if you have ideas or you have existing um, remedies for things that are known well you could develop a business around that but if you say well i can get into this other thing and potentially i can make you know 100 times more i'm going to do that and then no one else is going to you know work on the the the, the, the thing that's known because the profit um, incentive is lower there um, so yeah, I think it, it definitely kind of distorts things in that, in that way. Um, I'm not trying to think of, it's kind of similar to, um, I've heard another argument from somebody I know where they said, well, the patent system actually incentivizes innovation because it, once you get the patent for something, then no one else can copy it. So it forces everyone else to come up with a different solution. No. So the example was, well, I think uh, Xerox Park. They got the early on. They got the, a patent for the mouse, and I think Apple bought the patent. So then no one, no one else could produce the mouse just the way Apple had done it. So that's why they had that single click mouse, single button mouse. That that was their their patented idea. And because of that, everyone else had to come up with two button mouse and trackballs. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. And isn't this wonderful? Because we came up with all yep. of this 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 new 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 variants of things. And but it kind of begs the question: It's like, but why would you assume that they wouldn't do this anyway? People get into the market not to just produce other products that other people are producing. So in the company that I own was founded uh, 40 years ago by my father. And the whole reason that it was developed was to solve problems in the market that he was, he was encountering problems and he came up with solutions. So it was, it was problem driven production. It wasn't, well, I have an idea for a company. Let's go see what everyone else is doing, and I'll just copy what they're doing. Nobody wants to do that because that's that's a much more difficult um, road to take on if you're going to start a new business because you've you're already going against an established you know player in the field. You want to differentiate yourself. You so. you do, except for things that are like interoperability, like um, 
like you know if if a standard develops like in the size of a laser printer cartridge i mean now you have you know canon epson hp none of them fit with each other because of patents right. um and so, but but, but, but is, it, is it because of the i mean i guess in the existence of the patent but i could see that occurring in a system without patents because each one they want their customer to only buy their toner so they're going to make it in a specific way so they have no to no no so so here's what i think happens there so okay. i think like um well just imagine a simple example like railroad tracks and, and you know you want them to be the same width from state to state and from country to country so the trains can go so certain things you need standards on right uh, and interoperability um so cars might differ but they all have the same rough size and wheelbase you know all that kind of stuff yeah. and they all use the same kind of gasoline because if you have 10 types of gasoline then the distribution system doesn't work right um, so I think what happens in printers is so HP, they make most of their money selling well, all of them, right? They make most of the money selling the cartridges, but right. they sell them at a really high price. The reason they're able to do that is because they, they're able to stop generics from selling a cartridge that would fit in there for one tenth, one fifth of the cost. The way they're able to do that is they just they, – they have their guys brainstorm a patentable invention, which is not that useful, but it's just – it satisfies the standards of patentability like a circuit that does something mm -hmm. unique but not really necessary, yeah. and they put half of the circuit on the printer and half on the uh, in the cartridge so that they mate with each other so that yeah. to, to make a cartridge that works with this printer, you have to, you have, to have a, a circuit on there, and you would infringe their patent. So, they, they use, so, so then other companies come up with a different size. Like I could see Canon, HP, and – and, and Epson and all these guys and brother um, all competing and making different features of printers, but they might make them the same cartridge or they might not. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. But the point is artificially making someone work around. So a good example would be like that, that one-click patent by Amazon. So they patented the idea of you have your shopping cart on your website full of goods, and you just push one button to buy yeah. instead of having to push two, like pushing, I want to buy this. I confirm it. They simplified it by having one button. It was one click, called one click, and they got a patent on that. So Barnes and Noble had to intentionally would, impair their website to make a second click, so they wouldn't infringe a patent. So yeah, it forced them to do a workaround, but it's not good. You know, it's like if you outlaw anything, people will do a workaround. If you outlaw marijuana, then people that want to get high, they will find something else. They'll smoke you know, incense and die. <laughs> okay. It's not yeah, good to yeah. make people do workarounds and do yeah. the less, the second most efficient thing. It's not good. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that, yeah, the argument against the patents then would be it, it, the things that we want everyone to copy because it is such a good idea makes that impossible. So it, it, it produces a net harm to society. Yeah. If, for, if it, 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 it imposes artificial heterogeneity, I think, right. and incompatibility, right. which is less efficient in some cases. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because you know the, the cartridge potential. I don't know. I'm not sure about the printer cartridge thing because they make so much money on those cartridges. So I could see them wanting to differentiate. Yeah, I think what would ha so even if but, but if it's a standard, it's like a VHS beta thing. Maybe correct. You know, the original printer, if they became had, if they had had say a monopoly uh, per, um, presence in the market, that would have sort of forced the issue. It's like, well, you know, 80 percent of the printers use this cartridge. I guess we'll just use the same cartridge because then people will buy our printer and they know it won't be difficult to get this replacement because everyone sells this other well ones. it could be that so hp starts out and then brother and the others start competing maybe they have different size cartridges but the point is for each one of these guys a generic could just make a, a cartridge that could fit in there yeah. uh because there would be no patent to stop that and the just the threat of generic competition would keep them from charging this crazy high price which the patent system enables whether there would be stand, standardization among things like that i don't know because some things it would like the VHS tape. I mean, you, you could have had Betamax and VHS. You could have had Blu-ray and HD DVD, but people don't want to have to have so many sources of things. I mean, you do have multiple sources now. Like if you want to buy music, you can stream it. You can buy the MP3. You can buy the LP. You can probably still buy the CD. Yeah. So there are multiple formats of things, um, but they don't they don't multiply to infinity <laughs> yeah. and they, if they happen naturally, it's fine. But if they happen um, because they, they serve different market needs. Yeah. Well, there's some things that are natural monopolies. And I think, and that's, that's where the real problem comes in with the state tries to intervene. And they recognize that, Oh, well, there's this natural monopoly. Well, 
it's monopoly. This is bad. We have to stop it. So you know, things like Facebook, they're sort of a natural monopoly. But yeah, I would. Thought a- AOL was a natural monopoly and we need to break it up. Well, obviously that was not necessary because like I said earlier, all these things resolve with time. Eventually, you know, everyone AOL was going to dominate the internet and, we, uh, you know, the, the Justice Department was getting involved in breaking them up. Well, AOL is a joke now. I, I don't even know if they're even around anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and you can be just they're just like an email service. Yeah, there's something different there. uh, uh, You could argue that like Bitcoin could be if it's universal money. I I don't I don't I think it's it's from an Austrian point of view, it's probably inaccurate to call it a natural monopoly because it's not like as Rothbard and these guys point out, like the only actual legitimate monopoly is something backed up by the threat of force. Um, So state monopolies. I don't know if there's another better term for it, but I guess in the sense of it's natural that. Well, everyone just kind of chose yeah. Facebook because yeah, yeah, we and, have and, time for one social media platform, and most people tended to go there. It wasn't like there was some law that saying, "Well, no one else can develop this," and or you have to use it. So I, I was kind of yeah. In, in the sense. in the language of the antitrust statutes in the U.S., uh, like Facebook would be a monopoly, but it's from my point of view, it'd be a natural one. So there's nothing wrong with it. Like if it emerges in the market and then there's no force being used to stop competitors. You know, in my space, did fall to Facebook, and Facebook is sort of facing competition. Yeah. I mean, network effects only go so far. I don't think they always guarantee one player. Uh, for money, I think it would and will. That's my guess. Um, for language, it would seem to, but it doesn't, right? I mean, I think what happens for language is there's a lingua franca. There's a second language that becomes universal, and that used to be French, mm-hmm. hence the term lingua franca, but now it's English. So a, sec- a universal second language is useful, but apparently people have value having their own historic cultural language so they preserve it even though there are some costs to having that so some things that have a network effects don't go to winner takes all they go to winner takes most or winner takes second place or something like that right. i and think for money it's going to be winner takes winner takes all or winner takes yeah, most any monopoly ever that's 100 oh, percent i'm not even sure if a good, even government monopoly i suppose i don't know no nothing's perfectly enforceable yeah, nothing's just like perfect. we never had pure communism you know yeah, they, yeah. but but it has monopolistic aspects because it's backed by force. So, and that's again the Austrian view that demonstrated preference and subjective value, and the Austrian view of utility um, as as ordinal, not cardinal, and it's not intersubject, intersubjectively, interpersonally comparable. That's the distinction between this mechanistic Chicago view um, of of the economy, right? As util utils that you can sum up, and there's market failure. There's this ideal model of perfect competition that the real market doesn't comply with, etc. Anyway, I think we've probably gone on long enough. Anything you want to conclude with or say before we go? No, I think I think we pretty much uh, covered everything. Um, what did, what do we you and I discuss? Maybe doing this on other topics. What we're we going to call it? Conversations with Greg or something? <laughs> what, what I forgot what, what name we were thinking I, I, of. Yeah, I don't I don't remember now. We'll we'll have to brainstorm some. Yeah, maybe we'll do this later. So people listening, Greg and I may do uh, occasional conversations about some topics uh, that I've wanted to discuss, but which my the random interviews I get, they don't always ask me what I want them to ask me. So Greg and I will maybe dissect a few issues that way. Yeah. And I'll, that and I'll, I think, I'll try. I'll try to push back where appropriate. So it's not. So I'm not a total yes man here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll 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 chat later. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.